on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good evening. Welcome to First Edition. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. On the programme tonight, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is in the Middle East on a diplomacy tour and is expected to urge leaders to prevent further escalation between Israel and Hamas. The PM has pledged to stand with Israel in their darkest hour and repeated the UK supports Israel's right to defend itself. And as we come on air, polls have just closed. In the mid-Bedfordshire and Tamworth by-election, a defeat in either seat will add to the Conservatives' woes as we creep towards a general election next year. But in what's seen as good news for the Tories, the Bibby Barge is back in business after migrants housed on the Portland ship were removed over safety fears back in August. Plus, 10.30, full review of tomorrow's newspapers with Thursday night's panel, Ava Santina and the Sons, Jack Elson. Thanks for joining us. Let's take a look at the front pages that have come in so far. The Metro is first up. There it is, front page, armed police swoop on water pistol boy. The story of 13-year-old knocked off his bike and detained by police after mistaking his toy gun for a real one. The FT leads with this. Israel's allies warn citizens to leave Lebanon as regional tensions rise. That's what's in for now, of course. We'll bring you more of those as soon as they arrive. Now to our top story tonight. Standing shoulder to shoulder. Today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak vowed to stand with Israel as it faces its darkest hour amid fears the conflict will spiral into an all-out war in the Middle East. I'm proud to stand here with you in Israel's darkest hour. As your friend, we will stand with you in solidarity. We will stand with your people, and we also want you to win. Well, the visit comes as 12-year-old Noya Dan, who suffered from autism, was found dead alongside her grandmother following the Hamas attack in Israel. The number of British nationals confirmed dead in the wake of the Hamas attacks rose to nine today, with a further seven still missing. Foreign Secretary James Cleverly has been in talks across the Middle East and has had meetings, has meetings scheduled with the Egyptian, Qatari and Turkish officials aimed at preventing the conflict from spreading across the region. Meanwhile, queues of lorries carrying food, water and medicine wait at the Rafa crossing between Gaza and Egypt with hopes it will open soon. A UNICEF representative has described the humanitarian crisis in Gaza as horrific and catastrophic. Let's get a word then from our Talk TV correspondent who's joining us from Jerusalem. Tom Much is there. Um, evening again to you, Tom. You've been updating regularly on this. Tell us more about the situation today. So really what is going on here, the big thing that everybody is waiting for right now is will Benjamin Netanyahu pull the trigger and order a ground invasion of Gaza? It seemed that this is kind of imminent every day now and the uh, Israeli defence minister was seen down uh, visiting his troops near the border of Gaza earlier today. However, there are still some very, very big obstacles that Israel would need to deal with. There is the presence of the 200 to 250 believed hostages that Hamas are holding, possibly in tunnels throughout Gaza. It would be very difficult to do a ground offensive that would in any way uh, be able to avoid casualties among those hostages. They also have to worry a lot about the potential of regional uh, escalation, like I spoke on the show yesterday, about the possibility of Hezbollah in Lebanon getting involved, who have a much stronger fighting force and a much bigger missile arsenal. So it really is that will he or won't he order the ground invasion, which could look extremely bloody, including for both sides. Taking Gaza, a huge urban city, would be a tall order. Tom, tell us about that visit from Rishi Sunak. What has the reaction to that been? So the reaction to Rishi Sunak's visit along with Joe Biden has been broadly positive. It is seen in Israel as something of a green light to continue what they've been doing. However, most people are still focused on Gaza and focused on the idea of whether there'll be a ground invasion or not. It was, it was seen as something of a diplomatic a 
achievement, but it hasn't really changed or moved the needle in terms of, you know, domestic politics in Israel here. Uh, there is a sense that as global leaders arrive, uh, President Biden a couple of days ago, Rishi Sunak today, arguably uh, more to come, uh, that in many ways this does delay any ground invasion. Is, is that seen as a, almost a Western tactic? If you keep arriving, showing up, shows of solidarity, all great. Uh, but is it putting off what Israel are intending to do in terms of that potential ground invasion? It could very well be. Israel would definitely not want, not want to launch a ground invasion while they do have another foreign leader on their soil, because it will be the moment of the ground invasion and the days after that are the potentially deadliest for people who are currently in Israel. So it could be part of that. It has also been suggested that diplomats, particularly European diplomats or British diplomats, are putting around feelers in countries like Qatar with links to both sides about potential ways to deal with sensitive issues like hostages that could potentially turn the temperature down on the conflict, if not stop it altogether. Tom, thank you very much indeed. That is Tom Much, our correspondent in Israel, joining us now back home. And the effects of this conflict haven't been eased by distance. There's a new headache for Keir Starmer as his comments on supporting Israel, particularly the nation's right to cut supplies to Gaza, have caused division within his own party. He's had to write to Labour councillors following around a dozen resignations in reaction to his comments. Joining me now is a member of the Momentum Executive, Martin Abrams, and the Conservative MP and leader of the parliamentary NATO delegation, Alex Shelbrook. Thanks for joining us both. Uh, Martin, first of all, what is it that Keir Starmer has said that has caused so much uh, eruption from certain sides of the party? Good evening. Well, I wouldn't underestimate the anger that's being felt amongst many of us in the Labour Party at the moment, and that's because... Uh, last week, when Keir Starmer was interviewed on LBC, Keir Starmer basically said that Israel had the right to essentially uh, commit war crimes by switching off water, food and electricity supplies and essentially uh, creating the forced exodus of 1.1 million people. And since then, he has kind of rolled back on that stance, saying that humanitarian corridors should now be opened but he hasn't apologized for that stance first and foremost and he's still uh, not mentioned a key word in all of this which is ceasefire and that is absolutely what we need to see uh, our political leaders talk about now is because we're seeing so much bloodshed and you know uh, the horrors that were committed by Hamas a couple of weeks ago you know they were unspeakable but one crime does not justify another crime. And that is exactly what we're seeing in Gaza at the moment. And as a parent of two young children, I am absolutely shocked and appalled to see the price that is being paid by children in Gaza. 1,000 children have now been killed in this conflict in Gaza, and my heart absolutely bleeds for them. Uh, people will all, uh, always argue on, on either side of this, as, as you know, Martin, on, on, on numbers and statistics and uh, the various uh, implications on either side of this. I, I get all of that. Um, there might be people watching this, however, saying, hang on a sec, you know, this is a, a, a democratically elected government, uh, a first world country, Israel, fighting what is essentially a medieval death cult that is a recognised and prescribed terror group. What is it about that that people on your side of Labour are not understanding? And perhaps that is Keir Starmer's position. Well, frankly, and I think that's a bit of a, a bizarre question. You know, I, I, first well, and foremost, a fact, I'm a though, humanitarian. Right, it I'm is, a, it is a fact. It's, one is a democratically elected country fighting a terrorist group, like an ISIS group. Well, Has book, first and that foremost, kind of I am a humanitarian, and I've, I've, I've mentioned how shocked We're all and appalled I was at the attacks by Hamas two weeks ago. But as I said, one crime does not justify another crime, and we are seeing uh, Israel absolutely bombard Gaza with tons and tons of munitions 
at the moment and there is a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding before our very eyes live in real time and we really need our political leaders to step up and call for a ceasefire to end the bloodshed and i think all reasonable people would agree with that you know we are seeing innocent people pay an absolutely catastrophic price um, uh, at the moment and we really need to allow these civilians in Gaza to get access to food to get access to water and uh, and for an end to the bloodshed do you do you sense and, and I ask this question completely objectively I hope you'll understand that but there are many people who will extrapolate from this that this is that the very part of the Labour Party that Keir Starmer has tried to get rid of. It is your guys, it is Momentum, it is the Corbynites, it is all of that area responsible for those allegations. Whatever people think of that, of anti-Semitism, this is you guys back in action and now you feel you have a mandate and a green light to display those traits that you were accused of and the very reason why Keir Starmer's moved on and left you guys behind. I mean, I'm... I'm almost speechless at that question, Ian, I really am. I'm a Jewish Labour Party member and I will not let my grief for those victims in Israel be used as a, as a weaponization for genocide. It is absolutely despicable what happened in Israel, but it is absolutely despicable what is happening in Gaza at the moment. So for you to point out that Keir Starmer is trying to get rid of this faction within the Labour Party. But it, it has tonight, been a, it's been a troubling tonight, faction. Listen to me. People, no, I'm going to answer this question. Hundreds and hundreds of Jewish people gathered tonight in Westminster uh, in absolute disgust at the war crimes that are being committed by Israel. So to basically homogenise an you're entire... You're kind of at it uh, already, really, Martin, aren't you? Or you're, you're talking about the war crimes. Israel would say, this is retaliation. The, 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 the crimes committed by Hamas on October the 7th were there for all to see and Italy uh, and so, Israel so, so are you, retaliating so just, to that. They're defending So do you think themselves. that justifies war crimes being committed then, Ian? You call it war crimes? Is that is that your, your terminology for a country defending well, the, itself the, against the, a prescribed the, terrorist the, group? The UN have described it as war crimes, what's happening in Gaza at the moment. Okay. Israel has switched off food, water, electricity supplies. They're made, uh, creating the forced deportation of over a million Gazan um civilians uh you know there, there are there are no humanitarian routes at the moment you know these are war crimes taking place before our very eyes and as i said okay. one crime does not uh, justify another i will keep going back to that phrase and you know we need our political leaders to stand up right, right. now and call for a ceasefire and an end to the bloodshed can, can i let's get a word from alec shelbrook uh, who's with us conservative mp alec uh, good to see you welcome as well um i mean give us your response to the overarching discussion we've just been having there uh, with martin well i think first of all i mean i i was asked by somebody about um what I thought about um, the explosion at the hospital, um, which um, has shocked so many people. And I said, well, the reality is, is that thousands more people are going to die. Um, and I think that what we have seen um, over the last couple of days is Western leaders trying to work in the area, in the region, to try and make sure this doesn't escalate to a regional level and create even more bloodshed at more borders, and equally trying to work with the Egyptian government um, at the Rafah border, trying to get aid in. But there are some reports that um, Hamas are stopping um, that aid coming in at the um, Gazan border. So um, this is a highly complex issue. Where I do totally disagree is this argument about its war crimes and about um, Israel um, being somehow the aggressor. The cause for a ceasefire means they want Israel to not respond, not to anything else. Well, we know what happens next. We saw it on the 7th of uh, October. We know, we know that... Um, um, that the bombings carry on. We know that the water pipes, the 100 million euros of EU aid that was put in to develop a water system in Gaza was dug up by Hamas, turned into rockets. This um, whole situation is coming from this terrorist organisation. And what we also know with an international law is that if you are to launch a ground invasion, you have to give the um, population time to leave. Um, last Thursday, last Thursday, a week ago, Israel said people need to leave Gaza City and move south. That is what they've been doing. That's not a war crime. That's working in international law to limit um, civilian loss of life. OK. Martin, you're shaking your head. I mean, I just completely disagree. I mean, I don't think Alec, Alec completely understands 
the the, the situation out there. Where, where are these people meant to go, Alec? You know, they, they, they're being asked to leave um, northern Gaza to go to southern Gaza, but Israel are bother, bombing southern Gaza. You know, they're being asked to leave southern Gaza and go to the uh, and go to the West Bank. But Israel are also uh, waging military cr- conflict in in the West Bank. These people have got nowhere to go, and you know you're essentially you're essentially asking the evacuation of what is essentially an open air prison, and it is a humanitarian catastrophe. And politicians like your sh- yourself, Alex, should show a little bit of humanity. How what is an acceptable number of dead children for you? A thousand children have died in the bombing in Gaza in the last week. OK, I kiss my children goodnight tonight. And if I was in Gaza, I would know I might not see them where, in the can morning. Can I ask, Martin, where, are you, getting that, that is where are you getting that figure of... By, where, by the Israeli okay. government. Where, where are you getting that figure of a 1,000 children, just out of interest? That is a, that is a, that is a, a confirmed figure. From Hamas? That is a confirmed figure, Ian. F- from Hamas? There are, listen, there are other agencies working in Gaza okay. that, are, that are totaling the number of dead. So you're disputing that, are you, Ian? No, I'm asking, out of interest, where you're the figure came You're disputing that on, on national TV. Did you hear me dispute it? Okay. Yes, I did. When? You just, you just questioned that number. That I, I asked you where out. the figure came that, is, that has been in most news reports, in most Western media over the last few days. And that is fine, which is why I asked the question. Um, right. In terms, do you think... Alex, of the visit by Rishi Sunak, do you sense that does anything for this war? Does it uh, in any way uh, enamour Israel to feel more supported? Will it cause a problem back home? Is it a disruption from what's going on in the UK? What is the, you know, it's, it's, it's lots of praise for leaders when they arrive in the middle of war zones. Uh, but is there any real point to it? Well, I think it is important that, um, from my perspective, that we um, do so solid, so show solidarity with um, the Israelis, with the Israeli government. This was an uninvited attack. I take issue with the statement that it's an open um, prison camp, uh, sorry, an open air prison camp. Reality is, it's Hamas who have, have caused that situation. Israel left the Gaza Strip 18 years ago. In that time, Hamas have systematically turned it into a base to um, attack Israel with the stated aim of the destruction of the state of Israel. That is Hamas's stated aim. And whereas um, our politicians are out there, American politicians are out there, other world leaders are out there, doing everything we can to um, work with Israel and try and keep the regional tensions down as much as anything else and discuss um, how we get humanitarian aid in. Israel working um, with the West to try and limit humanitarian casualties, whereas Hamas wants to use the population to actually cause um, um, more death and destruction by shielding where they come from. That's why um, Israel is saying um, you need to... um, move out of this area, this is where the ground offence is going to come because the tunnel network's underneath. And it is highly complex. But what I think is important is that you show the solidarity um, with the democratically elected free country of Israel to attack the prescribed terrorist organisation that keep launching murderous attacks upon it, because it wasn't just what happened last week, um, a couple of weeks ago, it's happening constantly. And you work within the regional area to try and uh, make sure that things can be done with humanitarian aid and not allow anybody else to agitate the situation and and open up new fronts. So I think it is important that um, Western leaders or any leaders um, engage in this situation rather than um, pull down the okay. shutters. I, it is, it is, it is a pity. It is a pity that um, the American president was only able to have meetings um, in Israel. I think it would have been beneficial to the sure. region if he'd been able to carry out his original um, schedule and plan at the same okay. time. I, I want to get a quick word from our panel in just a second. Can I just ask you very quickly, Martin? Even from a, a momentum left-wing perspective. Was it good to see Rishi Sunak there? He talked about humanitarian issues. He's visiting various characters and leaders in that area, not just on one side. Is that a positive? I mean, I don't think there's really any anything positive that's come out of it if Israel is still bombing and uh, killing, uh, you know, civilians, women and children as we speak, you know, Rishi Sunak and UK's political leaders, leaders have essentially green-lighted these actions uh, from Israel. And until they demand a ceasefire, 
Um, no, the, I can't see anything positive coming out of it other than but, just a PR exercise fire. for the a failing politician purely... and a PR exercise for Benjamin Netanyahu, who should be uh, essentially tried in The Hague for war crimes after this conflict finally ends. What, what about right, the boys just, and girls over there at Hamas? Do you not think they might be in the same dock, uh, possibly ahead of Mr Netanyahu, if that's your suggestion? Sorry, I didn't catch that, Ian. The... the, the People who are running, leading, instructing Hamas, should they not be ahead of anyone in that queue for war crimes? Well, is there a queue? Well, you know, Hamas committed horrendous terrorist acts in Israel. I said that at the top of this interview. Okay. Ian, and as, a Jewish person, as a Jewish person, my heart absolutely bleeds for every single one of those victims in Israel. All right. But as I said, one crime does not justify another crime Just, and my heart also yearns for every single I hear it I hear it Martin thank you I, to I, death in Gaza. Uh, Alec very very quickly you wanted to come back in on that very briefly 10 seconds if you could sir yeah simply I mean the discussion of a ceasefire means Israel don't do anything allow Hamas to attack you again and the reality is is that when we talk about uh war crimes. There are war crimes and terrorist acts being enacted upon Israel on a daily basis and enough is enough. And if we want to stop the bloodshed and the killing, Hamas has to be taken out as the okay. organisation which is killing thousands of people in Israel and in the Gaza Strip. Alright guys, we stop there for time. Thank you. That was member for the Momentum Executive, Martin Abrams and the Conservative MP and leader of the Parliamentary NATO delegation, Alex Shelbrook with us. Thank you both. Uh, we're going to get a quick word, I think, very briefly from our panel. Um, Jack, Firstly, you just heard, just in a sentence, if you would, what do you make of what we just heard there? Very difference, of, a big difference of opinion between Martin and Alec. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like there was a big difference of opinion. Highly charged debate, obviously thousands of people dead in this appalling conflict. However, it seems that you know, within the normal bands of debate in society, most people agree that sparing civilian life is the number one cost here. That's what you saw with Richie Sunak okay. today. He went to Israel. The whole point, obviously, was to pledge solidarity with the Israelis, but also saying, let's try and save as many people as we can. Ava, in a sentence? Well, I think that is what actually Martin was trying to say. I think he did say on record quite a few times there that Hamas were terrorists and that atrocities were horrendous. But yeah, the conversation absolutely now is where Sunak goes from this. And Sunak has actually rode back further than I think Alex Shelbrook was during that interview. I think Alex Shelbrook might have been a, a few paces ahead of Sunak. Sunak is trying to calm relations in the Middle East. It seems a little bit, mm. little bit different there, okay. a little more wary. Uh, we'll have more on this, plus an in-depth look at tomorrow's newspapers with Thursday night's panel. Plus, the Bibi, Bibi Stockholm is back in business. Uh, will this save the Tories' migration policy? All of that and more on its way. You're watching First Edition live on Talk TV.
And welcome back. Let's take a look at more on the front pages that have just arrived. Straight into the inbox is the I. There it is, front page there. Fears grow that war will spread as UK and US tell their citizens to leave Lebanon. Uh, the Daily Mail has landed in the inbox too. Front page, there is no forgiveness for this thing. Only total annihilation of Hamas. You will soon see Gaza from the inside. This is the Israeli Defence Minister speaking. The Sun is also in. Just arrived. Uh, my Paul died happy smoking a split. This is Paul O'Grady's husband. The Times has arrived as well. There it is, front page. Do your bit to ease Israel crisis. Sunak urges Saudis. Uh, one of Sunak's visits from earlier today. And uh, finally, the Telegraph uh, in this section is in as well. Get ready to see Gaza from the inside. That comment again. More of that as they arrive. Now, the government will be looking to restore credibility in its immigration plan after the first asylum seekers were brought back to the Bibi Stockholm barge more than two months after it was evacuated. What started with 39 immigrants stepping on board during the government's August small boats week then ended with them evacuated back to hotels after just five nights, embarrassing the Home Office and its intentions to reduce hotel bills. The Tories' small boats plan will be their last chance saloon if they want to feasibly shift public opinion ahead of the next general election. But any remaining hope could be pulled from underneath their feet in a matter of hours as the polls for the Tamworth and Mid-Bedfordshire by-elections have closed. Any wins for Labour in either of these seats will naturally be seen as catastrophic for the government. Joining me now is the director of JL Partners, Scarlett McGuire. Scarlett, welcome to you. Early doors, of course. The polls have only just closed. Um, but what do we make of the predictions? What do we know on that side so far? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I think the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, we, we actually don't know what's going to happen. But I think the fact that we don't know what's going to happen is significant in and of itself. So these should be very safe Conservative constituencies. And I think we've got quite used to in the last year or so seeing these massive Tory majorities overturned. Now, obviously, you know, by-elections do favour the opposing parties. People like to give governments kicking in by-elections. But even so, we've been getting used to swings of sort of 20% or more. And I think actually that maybe slightly then sort of underplays how significant, uh, especially Tamworth could be here if Labour do manage to take it. If Labour were to, I, I mean, you mentioned Tamworth, but uh, one or both of those seats, um, is that kind of symbolic of game up for the Tories? Because but both of these are existing, as you rightly say, huge majorities. There is precedent for huge majorities being overturned. We've seen it very recently. However, two on the bounce, just like this, would that signify the end for the Conservatives? I don't think you can ever say the end, but I do think it makes it much harder. So there was a little bit of momentum, I feel like, um, for the Conservatives actually going into Conservative Party conference. They thought there might be a sense that maybe polls were starting to narrow a bit, a bit after the net zero announcements and some of the other things, some of that sort of renewed energy we saw from Rishi Sunak in September. Um, but I think the problem is with this is if they lose, to be honest, if they lose both especially, but even if they lose one, it means another slew of negative headlines, uh, another sort of set of bad mood against uh, amongst the backbenchers uh, and within the own party. And again, just this narrative that they're sort of losers. They're not going to be able to win anything. I think especially when you set that against the sort of success that Keir Starmer's Labour Party has seen in Scotland and by election there a couple of weeks ago, um, I think that will make it incredibly difficult. And I think then it becomes harder and harder to see a path back for them at the moment. Is there anything in the polling that suggests that, you know, one policy in the right direction? I'm thinking of the small boats plan with the Bibby Barge back in action today. The migration policy very much central uh, to what Rishi Sunak has been talking about for the last year. One of the big pledges, of course, was about reducing it. Um, if he gets that right, can the fortunes be turned around? Does the polling show that if he can at least tick some of those boxes, then he could turn things around? I think the problem is for him is that the, the more time that goes on, the more boxes he's going to have to tick. So the pervasive mood in the country at the moment, when, when I sit in focus groups at any rate, sort of all over the place, is that people have this general sense that um, nothing is really working very well. And that's everything from, you know, them feeling poorer than they did a few years ago uh, to frustrations at uh, an immigration system they perceive to be, you know, not working properly uh, to things like the NHS as well. And so I think the problem is, is that at the moment they then see Rishi Sunak and 
and his Conservative government as fundamentally something that's not able to deliver for them. And that means that they're going to have to start being able to deliver on really quite an awful lot to change that perception. Whereas they've started to get to a point where, yes, they might not be that sure about Keir Starmer, but they think, OK, well, he might be able to deliver more. The chances are, anyway, in their minds, that he'll be able to slightly deliver more than what we've seen uh, recently from the Conservatives. And so they're willing to give it a go anyway. So I think it's going to become harder and harder. And actually, yeah. it's going to require sort of uh, bigger and bigger things from the Conservatives. And crucially, I think what it will require is not just we've seen plenty of dialing up on rhetoric, but it actually needs to be delivery to match that rhetoric. Otherwise, uh, there's sort of a gaping hole between what they're saying they're going to do and what they're doing. And, and the public picks up on that, I think. Indeed. Listen, Scarlett, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Scarlett McGuire, Director of JL Partners. Thank you. Let's bring our panel back in, Ava and Jack. Ava, you've been on the mooch today in mid-beds. Uh, you've been on the ground. Uh, what's it looking, what's it, what's it feeling like there? Can you sense victory one way or the other when you walk the good streets of that neck of the woods? Well, I actually think Scarlett is bang on there. It's really difficult. I mean, even the parties don't know which way it's going. They've both yeah. sent messages out tonight or, you know, they, they sent out correspondence basically saying, you know, we might lose this, essentially. They've kind of admitted to it. But going around the constituency, in the towns, it was very easy to find Labour voters. People were out and proud, willing to tell us that they had voted Labour. So he travelled out a bit to the shires because obviously there are a lot of farmlands there. There are a lot of, you know, a huge swathes of countries side no one would tell us how they voted and that's where i think the problem What's is for the labor deal well it's it? shy Some... conservatives they don't want you to tell that? you they might have put in their postal vote or they might have voted it's only for ever been a conservative constituency right well yeah quite since 1937 yeah. but you know the interesting the, the thing about these you know th these conservatives who might live out in the farmlands is the inheritance tax offer that came from the conservatives yeah. just a couple of weeks ago which is we might scrap it now these are the people who are going to be very interested in that sort of pledge they might be voting in their personal interest, but not want to tell a journalist about it. Yeah, it could be that, Jack. I mean, that's not unusually the shy, the shy Tory. We've been there many times before. Yeah, I mean, it could be a factor. I mean, Ava is right. This is incredibly close to the by-elections. I think the only thing we are certain of at half past ten, with still a few hours of counting to go, is that the Tory vote is going to go way down in both seats. Now, even if they do hang on, let's say by a few thousand votes, is that really something for Rishi Sunak to you know, scream to the rafters about and cheer? Yeah. He still could be 15,000 like? votes down, couldn't he? He might get a quick PR win out of it. You know, he holds these two seats. It's great. Labour haven't managed to snatch yep. them. But pollsters are saying the, the, the swing of it, even if you lose 15,000, 20,000 votes, that's really dangerous. But, but the point, I mean, by-elections do, you know, ten, generally tend to show a bit of a dip. So if it went from 25,000 to seven or 8,000, has he got bragging rights on that? Potentially. It's not as disastrous as potentially it could be. 500 and, would be a bit rubbish. Yeah, yeah, completely. And you're right, you know, governing parties often get a kicking midterm in yeah. by-elections. They're never good for them. However, Rishi Sunak has got an uphill struggle if he wants to stay in number 10 after the next election. And these really, in terms of framing the narrative, you know, it's been one by-election after the other, which they've lost. Obviously, they had a bit of good news with Uxbridge. He really, really needs these two, I think, going, in, going into next year. Yeah. And in that sense... Uh, the, the point that I said to Scarlett there, Ava, about how symbolic this is, how, or how representative it is, of what's likely to happen in a general election. I mean, who knows? They've still got to overturn a 70-odd majority, which will, still, will take some doing regardless. But to lose two big seats like this is not just a bit of a win for Labour. It's massive. Well, no, but you're right to call them true blue seats. You know, they, they are, you know, particularly conservative seats. And it's, it, it's, you know, it's shocking that they're even up for contest in the first place. However, the circumstances in which they're up for grabs is, is rather organic, right? So you've got Nadine Dorries, who was culture secretary, and she disgraced her, 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 sorry, excuse me, her constituents because she hung on for so long because mm. she was waiting for a potential peerage. And that upset many of the people who live in the local area. Area. And on the other side of that, you've got Chris Pincher, who disgraced the government and actually brought down Boris Johnson, you know, because of his alleged sure, sexual yeah. misconduct scandal. So, you know, you've got two really organic situations here that have been really widely reported on, huge in the press. And, you know, the constituents are reacting to that. So I don't really think that you can, you know, use those as a marker for what the general election Yeah, maybe was. not. I mean, I, I find it, Jack, frustrating that I can uh, go on a search engine and get an answer to anything in a nanosecond. I can ask a speaker in my kitchen, how far away is the moon? And it will give me an answer. 
but if I want the result from a by-election, I've got to wait 16 hours for human <laughs> beings to count things. I mean, how are we still there in that respect? I know that some people say, this is a great, it's a pure This is British way, democracy, you know. Ian. It's, yeah, it's human beings counting bits of it. Isn't that fantastic? No, it isn't. It's a waste of everybody's time. I want to know at like one minute past 10 who won. Well, then I we can all go to the pub and have a drink, can't we? <laughs> I quite like the whole sort of theatre of it. You know, people in, you know, big sports halls counting stuff late into the night, everyone up, you know, fueled on seven cups of coffee, and crucially, they can't be hacked, can but they? You can't hack anyone with a, yes. with a pencil and you, paper. You've probably done it, Abe. Probably, I, I've sat there on those counts, and you think, you know, I, you're just about to start eating your own eyeballs <laughs> because you, you think, how many more? It's about to happen. Oh, look, I can see that, it, that. No, no, it's not. It's a false alarm. Ten hours later, somebody walks up on the stage and they move a vase, and off they go again. Three hours after that, you finally get a result. But you do have that fantastic opportunity to sort of walk round and watch them counting, and there's no Which rhyme is great or for rhythm. An hour. Right, but there's no rhyme or rhythm to the piles that are being constructed by the counters. But the journalists will come away with some kind of assumption. Correct. <laughs> yes, they always there's go. No... Ah. <laughs> you can see, by the way, it was stacked in the yes. Stengali move yeah. over there on table one. Yeah. But you've got, you'll go, well, there was a furrowed brow over on table four, so yeah. that must be a Lib Dem victory. And none it, of that it, actually... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, it, it, it does take an awful lot of time. And I know there's, you know, good democratic reasons uh, behind it, apparently, Jack. But nonetheless, I mean, this will be... I mean, Rishi Sunak is in Israel. That's where he will be, and that's where he will have to comment on this. Um, as we were saying a second ago, the, the press releases have already been written, mm. covering their own backsides. Ah, we knew we wouldn't win it. We knew it was going to be a challenge. The same old vacuous platitudes are wheeled out every time, right? Expectation management and parties spend weeks, months rolling the pitch, you know, saying that basically, oh, this is an incredibly tough set of by-elections for us. We're not going to win. Why? So that if they do pull off a shock victory, they can claim it as a massive, massive victory, you know, really hammered up in the press. And if they lose, it's obviously, oh, well, we told you we probably weren't going to win, and therefore yeah. it's not as bad as everyone of you might say. You've got your just final point on this. You have your ear to the ground, Jack and Ava. Um, give us your predictions, then, of those two seats. I think that mid-Bedfordshire is going to be incredibly close just because Labour and the Lib Dems have both been going for it. Usually yeah, yeah. in the past, we've seen them have a sort of a one person sort of, you know, sits this one out agreement. They haven't had that this time. They've both been going for it, hammering tong. And with the first past the post system, you could just see the Tories sneak up, but you know, it's, a, it's a fool's game at this point. Over. I'm going to be boring and agree with Jack, but I think Labour might just clinch mid beds, but I do think it might be a Tory holding. It's together. interesting you say that because many people are arguing the other way around. That mm. It'll be Tamworth, and that's got the uh, more um, dodgy backstory, if you like, uh, yeah. in terms of how the by election came around. Well, I like, you know, look, I look forward to being wrong. However, you know, the we postal votes were poor in uh, mid-beds and Andrew Cooper, who came out yeah. and had that disgraceful thing to say about food banks, that yeah. actually might have gotten a few votes. There it is. Uh, coming up, Jack and Ava remaining with us for an in-depth look at tomorrow's newspapers, including this story in The Sun, being a bit thick. Yeah, find out more on that. You're watching First Edition. We're live on Talk TV. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. 
the one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. But the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. Well, I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know, you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this girl. <laughs> 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 I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. We have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back, uh, just before we go back to our panel for a full paper review. One more front page has just arrived. It is the Daily Star. There it is, freeze. Uh, cops and the story of the man who pretended to be a mannequin uh, in order to rob the place. Uh, there it is. Uh, let's bring in Thursday night's first edition panel, non-mannequin, real people alongside me. Political correspondent at Politi Politics Joe is Ava Santina and political correspondent at The Sun, Jack Elson. Um, where should we start? There's a lot to get through here. T talking of uh, curious uh, crimes or non-crimes in this case, uh, police mistaking the boy's water pistol for a gun. A mother is described as feeling broken and betrayed by the Met Police after armed officers surrounded her 13-year-old son and then handcuffed him when they mistook his plastic water pistol for a handgun. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wonder if you're the police, you obviously thought it could have been a gun. Otherwise, what you get, why would you stop somebody with a water pistol? This is, you know, one of this is one of the few stories that have really stopped me about the Met in the past couple of yeah. months, and I, I really think this is probably one of the most harrowing stories I have heard in the. Well, actually, do you know what the Met? In, probably in the last couple of weeks. This is awful. This is a 13-year-old boy who was playing with a water pistol, mm -hmm. you know, right outside his house. The mother knew where he was. A police officer who was unarmed rang back to, to an armed unit and brought in firearms officers. Of course you knew that wasn't an actual gun. Why would a 13-year-old child hold a gun? And, you know, the worst part... What do you mean, why would a 13-year-old child? why on earth kids, would kids one... Kids have guns and knives. No, if... come on. Have you never... A You're a journalist, year old child. Exactly. 13-year-olds I I carry, carry lethal journalist. weapons. And I spent a lot of my career standing on, you know, lines that were, were drawn by police officers because the stabbing had just happened. I can tell you for right now, that police officer... No, I can't say that. But anyway, look... So you th I hang on. You're saying I a police officer looked at a kid with a water pistol and went, right... I know it's a water pistol, but for a giggle, I'm going to get the armed boys in. Do you know, this is really difficult for me because I feel like I can be objective about most stories and this story has really upset me in a way that... I didn't even know you'd have an opinion no, on I this really, story. No, I really so do. I, could... I think it's really upsetting. And, you know, the mother is reporting that this child is so distraught, it's completely changed his personality. Maybe You I know, have. The, Met, the Met police have given over a liaison and they are working with him. But you It's know, not I, ideal. I'm not I defending it. I just can't imagine changes. a couple would have just for no, made it up. And, I mean, that's a lot of... To try and get the police out for anything is difficult. To, to mobilise, Jack, the armed side of the policing, yeah, I, I can only imagine the, the officer that alerted his colleagues or her colleagues would have, must have genuinely thought, this is, it's possible. This is one of those stories where if it had gone the other way, you can see the headlines, you know, the police mm. officer said, I thought it was just a water pistol, and yet there was carnage that ensued. You can almost see it 
the other way around. Yes, completely. And, you know, the Metropolitan Police over the past few years haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. True. You would like to think that in this occasion, the police officer, of course, thought this was a real gun. You know, we have obviously been known for very young children to carry weapons. And, you know, we're in a height, you know, we're in a sort of state of yeah. heightened tensions, especially in London at the moment. But obviously, I completely feel for this poor boy who's been knocked off his bike just playing with his mates with a water pistol. Um, and I, and I think that obviously the police needs to sort of answer questions about exactly how they got this uh, how they got this mistake in the first place. But that is, you know, it's kind of part and parcel of living in a society that mistakes do sometimes happen. No, I think the force needs to start asking itself serious questions right now. Which like is what is know, a water pistol? Yeah, but also you know accountability. You know the, the, the life of this thirteen year old boy has probably been drastically changed or dramatically changed in a way that that mother or that boy could have never anticipated. And the force needs to start asking itself. Are they going after the right people? Are they really going after crimes or are they just making big assumptions and wasting a lot of taxpayers' Th this money? This was a kid in Hackney carrying what somebody thought was a gun. This is a high crime area where kids carry out lethal attacks. Can I just add another point? Should 13-year-olds be playing with water pistols? Of course they should 13? be. 13? Really? Child. I think that's right. I, just, I, I reckon, no, I think maybe 11, you're done with the pistol. But, you know, this reminds me oh of a similar situation that happened in America, and I believe there was actually a fatal shooting that followed Quite it. Quite possibly. Know, so. I mean, there have been people mistaken for things that look far more obviously like a gun, and you can, regrettably and all the rest of it, but you can kind of half get your head around. I mean, I understand, you know, it does seem... It wasn't, by the way, I should say, in defence of what you're saying, Ava, it wasn't something that, like, a water pistol that resembled an Uzi or something. Apparently it was what, it was pink or yellow mm, or something. It was a brightly coloured, Brightly yeah. coloured thing. Um, let's move to another criminal story. This one never seems to be out of the headlines at the moment. Shoplifting on the rise, but please charge fewer suspects. We're sort of in the era of shoplifting, aren't we? It seems to be... That's how people will look back. Do you remember, you know, this was the space age. This is the shoplifting age. It's yeah. almost a licence to nick now. And it really grinds people's gears, doesn't it? And you can look at it in two ways. You can look at it as either sort of part of maybe a wider cost of living crisis and people think that they can't pay for things and therefore they have to steal it. But also there is definitely a case about not enforcing proper laws in this country. And it's a gift to Labour at the moment who are trying to just you know, ride roughshod over the Tories, um, you know, law, law and order credentials because it doesn't seem, like you said, a day goes by without shoplifting stats or a yeah. shoplifting incident being in the headlines and, you know, for people that actually go and pay their way in supermarkets, it's the most infuriating thing, isn't it? There was a 25% uh, rise uh, in, in shoplifting in the last... Which is huge. Yeah, I mean, that, is, that's, yeah. a, that's a, a massive rise. Figures published by the Home Office also reported increases in robbery, knife crime, gun crime, nothing on water pistols. Uh, police recorded 365,000 shoplifting offences, up by a quarter. Uh, however, the, those charged did overall... Officers charged a suspect in 12.2% of cases in the three months to June. That's down from 15% on the previous section. Mm, but you've what's, got going, what's going on there? Well, you've got a series of factors at play, right? So you've got massive food inflation, you know, inflation generally across the board, but you've also got, you know, police or courts can't convict and send people to yeah. prison at the moment because there aren't enough spaces for them. And you've also got, you know, Chris Philp, our policing minister, <laughs> instructing people to become essentially vigilantes, which is, you know, if you see a crime happening, <laughs> maybe do a citizen's rest. So, you know, you've got a number of factors at play here that are based. You've got the Wild West thing. happening out there. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, you know, if someone nicks a tin of beans off, uh, off a shelf and runs out with it, it's probably unlikely that the security guards there are going to chase after him down the street and tackle him. You know, they've probably not paid enough money to potentially but, confront someone who could, could turn out to be violent. I mean, so there's no, there's, what's, you know, what's the point in doing it? But obviously this is a massive issue, but how you solve it currently remains to be seen. Correct. And there, there is no doubt about it. There is a copycat nature now because of what is happening, the sweet shops on Oxford Street, the sports shops, mm. etc., where people aren't nicking because they're starving, they're nicking because it's almost like a fashion. Mm. And on top of that, just to bolt on to the end of that, it, the chances of you getting caught are quite slim. Even if you are caught, there's the evidence, the chances are you won't get charged, that will get dropped. And, and like, you know, in California and places like that, where, what is it, $2,000, it's got to be over $2,000 before the cops will even show. Mm. Yeah. How did we end up in this world? You yeah. used to tar and feather people that nicked things. And now they're talking about... What are we doing now? <laughs> it's just like, it's no problem at all. Just take the gear, mate, and off you go, Would son. you like it to go Bloody back to Lee Miz? No, I don't. I can... <laughs> yeah, master of the house, that's me. <laughs> Loaf <I'm> of bread. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's look at a couple of other stories as well that are in. Um, I like this. This is in The Sun, page 7. Uh, a good sleep is the key to warding off the blues, researchers say. Aren't we all 
fascinated by sleep. You know, do you, how much of it do you need? Do you the eight hours thing? Is that a myth? Is your circadian rhythm meant to wake you up at five thirty? Because that's what our lizard brains tell us. Thatcher had a brilliant mind. Only slept for four and a half hours. Best-selling book a couple of years ago. But famously grumpy sleep. as well. So famously very grumpy and a very hard person to work for. So, I, I mean, I don't know whether there is any science. I, I, I think this is one of those stories that in 100 years' time we still won't know the secret recipe to sleep. All we do know is that when you get good sleep, whether it's long or otherwise, you feel better, right? Mm. Well, I mean, I feel terrible today and I had an awful night's sleep last night. But, yeah. you, know, um, you know, sleep is constantly in the news at the moment and particularly about our skin. I don't know how much you're both interested in uh, keeping your youthful faces. You've both got very youthful skin so perhaps you are invested in this but if you're not I am 17 hours, if you yes know, well so. <laughs> um if you're not getting your eight hours apparently that is the uh the, you're on so right on key, track for wrinkles the key is it yeah that's the key sleep mm. there's an encyclopedia of sleep now you know when we were growing up you know it was just to get your eight hours and you'll be fine and now there's books about sleep there's podcasts about sleep there's studies about sleep and obviously it is incredibly important because you spend a third of your life sleeping you uh you probably know how to do it properly yeah it is horrible though isn't it being tired is a I mean, pro not when you're a bit, you know, knackered to coin the phrase. I mean, really tired. It's horrible. It's a horror. It's worse than a hangover. It's a horrible feeling. Mm, but I also think, you know, sleep is becoming more difficult as, you know, in the age of information, not to be incredibly boring. But, you know, yeah. if you've got a phone where you can basically look up anything and be entertained the entire evening, then how on earth do you convince your brain to turn off? Do you have your phone in your bed? I do. I do. It's awful. Jack? Uh, I do indeed, but also as journalists, we are obviously wired on coffee 24-7, um, and so that obviously doesn't help uh, get That's into, a schoolboy error for a start, isn't yeah. it? I was, one of the, I was a late adopter to the take your phone to bed group. Yeah, I just didn't do it. My other half thought it was the most extraordinary thing. You don't have your phone here. Everybody takes their phones to bed. And I didn't. I think she thought it was amazing. It's like, this is like cool, this guy. And then somehow it just kind of crept in. Mm -hmm. But the trick is not to, not to look at it bef just before you go to sleep, apparently. Yeah. It's got to be like a half hour. I'm one failing hour there. Window. I'm failing there. As a news junkie, I'm scrolling through the That's news the very late into the night. And then you link to something else. Yeah. And you counter check. And, and then, then you're watching you... Gordon Ramsay videos, you know, at yeah. 1 a.m. What? <laughs> yes, it always, all roads lead to Ramsay, it seems. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at uh, the next story. Uh, here's a lighter one. Uh, this is in the sun. Chew what? Beans a bit thick. Heinz released recipe for beans on toast. Heinz have created a step by step card. Because one in five people have no idea. Um, I mean, I, I, I thought when I saw this, they were going to tell you about their recipe mm. for baked beans. Because nothing can replicate Heinz beans. When I was a kid, my mum tried a crafty tin of Cross and Blackwell, and I rumbled her within one spoonful. Uh. I knew it. I thought they were going to tell us how they make their beans, but this is apparently how to prepare it properly on toast, Jack. Yes, it's a very bizarre story, isn't it? Apparently one, in five, one, in, one in five people have absolutely no idea how to make beans on toast. Can you not? What, what's wrong? You should be in jail if you can't make beans on toast, right? How are you making your beans on toast? You get the beans and you put it on the toast. No, but how, how cooked are they? How you stewed are they? You warm them up. You just warm them up. Just warming them. 30 seconds in a microwave, whack it on the toast. Oh, I wouldn't enough. touch that person, then. Yeah. Although this is missing a sixth well, step. Go on. Just put the brown sauce on top of it, which I always have. And with that? Every time. I can get that. Worcester sauce is also a good option. As is pepper alongside the Worcester sauce. As is a bit of cheese, if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I do, I do think this is a pretty good marketing ploy by the PR people at Heinz, because now everyone knows how to make beans on toast. Let's be honest, you, you don't know. It's called beans on toast. Theo. It's in the name, isn't it? I think now we're all talking about Heinz beans again. You know, they're going to get some... They're going to get some sales off of this. I, I don't know how you can not make beans on toast, although I'm sensing some kind of microwave fascism from um, Ava there when I mentioned heat it up in the microwave. And Cass, our producer, in my ear, just went, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. <laughs> when I mentioned the microwave. What's wrong with the microwave? No, no, absolutely not. They need to be in a pot. What's the difference? Pot. Yeah, well, they just have a different You're heating texture. up beans. No, yeah, because it's all it's about the texture. It's not But you don't, want, beans. No, you don't want it to be too runny. You don't want the, you know, the bean sauce to be, you know... You want it quite thick. You, don't, you want some You don't know what you're it. missing, Ian. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Get it on the hob. 60 seconds in a microwave on your toast. Job done. Well, you've upped it now. It was 30 seconds a minute. Did I say 30? You did, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was thinking of a small portion. There you go. You can have cold beans as well. It is, I think, pound for pound, beans on toast is just the greatest very quick lunchtime-y snack, isn't it? I mean, it's you can't... 
I think this might be in reaction to um, a recent food piece that said that most own brand beans were just as good as Heinz. No, no there's definitely a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. There's definitely really a difference. Um, final one, I think, here. We will weed out fake reviews, vows websites facing legal crackdown. Amazon, Booking.com, TripAdvisor and other big online sites have teamed up to combat fake reviews as they face the pressure to crack down on the problem. Oh, this this is going to get a lot worse, isn't it? I mean, everything is fake. Deep fake, fake voices, the Starmer thing the other day. There'll be more of that in video, online. How can you stop this? Mm. Well, is I'll there a way to stop this? I'll shock you and tell you that actually most products that are in the top 10 of each category on Amazon are just, just based off of reviews. And actually, a lot of people pay basically review farms to go and rate their product, which pushes them up the chart. So there's no authenticity in it. There are some controls. Yeah. Amazon do have a few yeah. controls, but not, not enough. There it is. Jack, listen, thank you very much indeed. Good to see you. Ava, thank you as ever. We will see you both very, very soon. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's it for first edition. You're watching here tonight on Talk TV. We are back at the same time on Monday. Have a great weekend.